Hey Spain lovers, you're coming to Spain and you want to understand how this country works. Uh, what are the opening hours? Uh, when do the locals eat? How does tipping work? Uh, is the siesta a thing or is it a myth? And is it Barcelona or Barcelona? Uh, stick with me. In this video, I'm going to answer all your burning questions about Spain. James Blick, co-founder of Devour Tours, and this channel is all about how we eat, drink, live and love in this wonderful country, Spain. Now, when I first came here eight years ago, I was completely lost. If I had known then what I know now, I would have had a much richer experience right off the get-go. So the first tip I'm going to give you is that this is a really varied country, so you have to think about when you're planning a trip here, which parts are you going to, what do you want, what experience do you want. I'm standing here beside Madrid's beautiful royal palace, and yeah, there's one royal palace in this country. But this is like a bunch of different countries thrust together with, with really different languages, different cuisines, different cultures, different traditional dress, different climates, different everything. So the north of Spain is called Green Spain, and up there it looks like New Zealand where I'm from, it looks like uh, Ireland, uh, strong Celtic influences. It's cooler, it rains a bit more, they drink cider and they play the bagpipes. And when you go south, you jump on a train and head south, it changes dramatically. That's where the palm trees are, and that's where parts of it could almost look like North Africa. There's a strong influence uh, from the Moors who invaded in the 8th century. Of course, the east coast, you've got Barcelona and Valencia for paella. And in the center, we've got Madrid, which is kind of a melting pot of all of it. So be really conscious of where you're going and plan your trip thinking of regions, thinking of climate. Keep in mind that it's cooler in the north, it's hotter in the south. But if you come in winter, it's pretty cool all over the entire country. So plan for that. Okay, next tip, opening hours. When do the shops and restaurants open in this country? Okay, so tip two, what are the opening hours of shops. Well, it depends a little bit. I'm here in the Anton Martin market in Madrid, a traditional market. And in traditional markets, traditional shops in the neighborhoods or in smaller towns, they'll open from the morning about 9 or so until 2 p.m. and then they'll close between 2 and 5 and then open again at 5 until 8 p.m. So that's like smaller businesses and, and in smaller places. You don't want to get caught between that 2 and 5 period because everything will shut down and that's when it gets really hot often too in summer. But of course, if you're in the center of the big cities, there's department stores there's supermarkets that are open all the time you know a little like back home so it really depends on the kind of business but of course the traditional establishments and the markets are the ones you really want to discover because those are the ones that are so unique to this country and have so much cultural importance uh, another thing to remember often the traditional places don't open on Saturday afternoons just in the morning and never on Sundays that's sacred okay that's shops what about bars and restaurants okay we're only on the second tip and I'm already having my first drink typical but what about bars and restaurants so we're here in La Esperanza, a fantastic new tapas bar here in the Lava Pies neighborhood. And now tapas bars will open from about midday or so till about 4 p.m. for lunch and then about 8 p.m. onward. So they will close, or the kitchen at least will close between about 4 and 8. And then restaurants, which are places where you don't stand at a bar, where you just sit down at a table, those will open from about maybe 9 or even 9.30 onward, so really late. So these really, really late uh, eating times begs the question of when the hell do we eat in Spain? What is our timetable for eating? So this is the, the next tip, number three. Well, it depends a little bit, but generally uh, breakfast is not a big deal in this country. Uh, it's really light. So in Madrid in the mornings, we'll have something sweet with a cup of coffee. Uh, in Catalonia, we'll have maybe pan con tomate, which is bread with tomato on it, uh, delicious. Uh, and in the south, you might have bread with almost like a pork spread pate on it. So remember I told you Spain is regional. The breakfast has changed a lot all over the country. Uh, and then lunch, that's an important meal. That is the big meal, and we'll have that between about 2 and 4 p.m. Now look, we, some of us work in offices. We don't eat for two hours, but that's kind of your range of time, 2 to 4, when people will be eating a lot of lunch. Uh, and on the weekend, we will have a long lunch, so that's a heavy meal. And you'll see here at Las Peranta, for example, they have a menu del día, and that's a fixed price menu or a fixed price lunch thing, three courses and a glass of wine that's included for about 15 euros. So that's a great way to enjoy lunch in these places, a really reasonable cost. And what about dinner? Dinner. Well, that's from about 9, 9.30 onwards. Even in the south, it can get really late, 10 p.m., 10.30 onwards. We eat dinner late, but it's lighter. 
keep that in mind. Ah, and I mentioned breakfast before. I should say also that coffee can sometimes be a little bit bad in some of the traditional places in Spain. It's getting better, but be ready for it. Uh, I actually wrote an article about that, Torre Facto. I'll put a link down below. Now, we're talking about food. We're talking about tapas. So let's go to another tapas bar where I can tell you a little bit about how the hell tapas works in this country. Guys, number four, tapas. It's such a confusing concept, but it's something you really need to understand when uh, you're coming to Spain because it's such an integral part of the experience of being here and enjoying this country, at least gastronomically. So what are tapas? Well, I've come here to La Berenjena, a fantastic tapas bar in the Lava Pies neighborhood. One of my favorites. They do it fantastic modern tapas, super delicious, great wines to explain a few things. Well, first of all, are tapas an aperitif? Is it uh, lunch? Is it dinner? Is it instead of dinner? So confusing. And I think if you go down that track, it's just a road to pain. What you got to think is tapas is an activity. We actually have a verb, tapear, which means to, to go out for tapas, to do tapas. So tapas is something you actually do. And if you think about it like that, you will understand it. You, you bar hop, you, you try different things here. You might meet people along the way. And it's just such a dynamic activity. I suggest a couple things. First of all, watch my video. I'll link to it below uh, another video I have all about how we do tapas here and that will help you understand and then go and do it yourself and you'll learn and, and it's no holds barred don't be afraid don't be timid uh, and the other thing is you could also try taking a devour tour but I'll leave that up to you the other thing I wanted to say is about a few food myths while I'm here and we're talking about food paella churros you know when do we eat these things do we eat this thing sangria do we drink it look paella is a is kind of a national dish in a way that you can get it all over the country but it's actually a regional dish from Valencia and a lot of it's really bad so again, I've got a video called Five Spanish Food Myths that you need to watch that deals with that. It also deals with churros. Churros are not for dessert. Chocolate is not for dessert here. It's for breakfast, morning tea, or afternoon tea. And the last one, sangria. Look, we don't drink much sangria here. It's a bit of a tourist drink. There's another option you could drink, so check out that video. It's number five, tipping. Do you tip in Spain? How much do you tip in Spain? I understand it's such a confusing concept. You know, whenever I go to the States, I'm totally bamboozled by the whole tipping thing. Look, here in Spain, it's a little bit simpler. In bars and restaurants, we tip, but not a lot. And it's not a calculation like you might do in the States. You know, the bars and waiters, their salaries are built. They don't rely on tips there, so they earn a full salary, although it might not be that, that much. So how it works here, look, if you're standing at the bar and you just have a cup of coffee, you know, spend a couple of euros, you probably won't leave a tip. You might leave 10 cents or something like that. If you sit down and have lunch, my wife and I sit down and have lunch or dinner, 30, 40 euros, you know, we'll leave a couple of euros, one, two, three euros, depending on the amount you leave a little bit of change that's the idea but it's not a calculation you do in your head so it's a little bit simpler now we need to have a sleep we're going to deal with a big myth here the siesta okay guys number six uh, the siesta is it a thing do people do it is it cliche is it real is it a myth let me explain look this is like the rest of the world a lot of people work in offices they can't go home and have a sleep or sleep under their desk so you know let's be realistic like you back home you just can't have a sleep after lunch all the time but when I go on holiday with my Spanish friends you know I much more than in New Zealand people are more likely I think to have a short little nap after lunch if possible so there's still something there in the culture but of course this is a country where it's hot often particularly when you're on holiday and lunch is big so that's some of the key drivers for the whole siesta thing here's the confusion a lot of people say to me that they think the siesta is the time between two and five when the traditional markets or the shops close got fly in my face uh, but no that is not the name of that is not called a siesta that's just the traditional hours that places used to close so people could go home and have lunch look siesta the best translation I've found is power nap it's literally the 20 to 30 minute uh, sleep that you will have after lunch here are my three tips for having the best siesta first never Never in your pajamas, second, never in bed, and third, never longer than 20 or 30 minutes. Because if you sleep longer, you will wake up in a bad mood. So the best siesta is the one you never really realized you had. You know, if you wake up and you're like, oh my God, was I asleep? I often do that. Then that's how you know it was a great one. If you know you slept, well, you're in trouble. You slept too long and you're gonna be in a bad mood for the rest of the day, you'll never recover. Now we're gonna deal with another cliche in Spain and that's bullfighting. So let's head up to a bullfighting bar and I'll tell you all about it. Does bullfighting still happen in Spain and should you see a bullfight? This is a question I've had a lot over the years and I understand the confusion because there's a little, there's a lot of change happening in Spain around bullfighting as well. Look, here's my take on it is that, yeah, bullfighting still happens in Spain, particularly in certain parts of the country, but you can understand this country perfectly well and have a wonderful 
experience without going to a bullfight. Here's what's going on, is that in certain regions, it's either been banned or, or isn't really practiced anymore. You know, you won't see bullfights in the Canary Islands or in Catalonia, but here in Madrid, for example, or the south, you will still see them during the season, uh, which starts in about spring. So I'm in a bar here in Madrid, in Casatoni, and they have bullfighting paraphernalia on the walls because this was a place where bullfighting fans would hang out. So you will still see parts of and vestiges of it uh, in, you know, in Andalusia and in Madrid. Look, my wife, who's right behind the camera there, has never been to a bullfight. She was born and bred in Madrid. So the younger generation is moving away from it because it just doesn't fit their morality anymore. Uh, so in that sense, it is on the way. I have been to a bullfight before. I was curious when I first got here, but I didn't like it and I won't go again. So make up your mind. But yep, you can still see them here and there. Okay, so tip number eight. Do people speak Spanish in Spain? Well, in the last tip, I was just mentioning my wife about bullfighting, so I thought she's an expert on this, so I should bring her in. So here she is, Yoli. Hey, uh, how are you? Flamenco expert and wonderful English speaker, as well as Spanish speaker. <laughs> Thank Spanish you very much. Speaker, Spanish speaker. <laughs> so Yoli, do Spaniards speak English? Well, uh, I'm speaking English, so a few, yeah, yeah, some Spanish do speak English. Um, it's true that the older generations, older people, uh, not so much, they don't speak uh, great English. Uh, then, you know, the younger people, of course, more and more. So definitely there's like a lot of uh, bilingual schools that we call. So all those young people, yes, of course, you know, and so more and more. In big, uh, bigger cities, of course, you're gonna find that people have a better level of English. Mm -hmm. uh, smaller towns, yeah, you know, a, a, a little, little more bit. Rough going. Yeah, a little bit. But I think what you'll going. find is that, you know, waiters generally, you'll yes. get by, you will survive. They'll make the effort, and you know, where there's a well, there's a way. So, exactly, yeah. perfectly said. Now, and there's a couple of things I wanted to point out that often happen when people are speaking English, uh, speaking Spanish, I'd say English speakers speaking Spanish. Is it Barcelona or Barcelona? Is it Sevilla or Seville? Okay, so here's the deal. It's Barcelona if you're speaking English. It's Barcelona if you're speaking Spanish. That's just how we say it in Spanish. Uh, it's Sevilla if you're speaking Spanish. It's Seville if you're speaking English. It's like saying Paris. You say Paris if you're a French person. You say Paris if you're an English speaker. Uh, and remember, Barça is the football team. Barna is the city. Barça is not uh, the city. It's not short for the city. And the last one, the famous dance, it's flamenco, not flamingo. Please! All right. <laughs> Yoli loves flamenco. I don't know what you think about flamingos, but we'll find out later. <laughs> okay, tip number nine. Nine. Uh, no, I am not in the jungle. I am in the Atocha train station here in the center of Madrid. And this is the perfect place to talk about how you should travel around this country. Planes, trains, car, walking, I don't know. Look, planes we all love in a way. They get us places fast, but it's not the best way to travel around Spain if you can avoid it because as we all know planes have massive security lines at airports and they always leave you in airports so they're way away from the center of the city so if you can take the fast train when you're moving around this country that is so much better look the Ave here the fast train travels at 300 kilometers an hour I have no idea what that is in miles per hour for the Americans out there but it's fast it'll get you from Madrid to Barcelona in a few hours Madrid to Seville in a few hours and there's a lot of connections all over the country and the beauty of the trains is the doors close only two minutes before the train leaves so you can you don't have to like get there four hours beforehand and the security is much lighter uh, than a plane plus the train stations are in the center this Atocha train station this jungle like place is literally right in the center of Madrid so you can walk to your hotel that's the beauty of it so take the trains now should you rent a car if you're gonna be going really off the beaten path and going to villages and things like that it might be handy to rent a car or at certain points of your trip so do keep that in mind if you want to go really off the beaten path uh, and and the other thing, one tip, when you're in Madrid and Barcelona specifically, uh, you can move around so easily on public transport, on the metro. There's no, never rent a car uh, driving around these cities. And you probably don't even need to take taxis. You can just move around on the subway and that way you get to rub shoulders with the locals, which of course makes you feel, you know, like you're having a more authentic experience. Number 10, a really, really important one. How do we greet people in this country? Uh, look, in formal situations in business or, you know, when you're meeting the king, everybody shakes hands. That's how it works but in informal situations it's a little bit different in informal situations meeting friends etc men shake men's hands uh, and women kiss everybody so women kiss men and women kiss women and when I say kiss I mean a kiss on two cheeks that's how we do it now sometimes men kiss men uh, when they're greeting and saying you know goodbye but that's if you're really close friends
friends or it's his family. So I kissed my brother and my father-in-law, Yoli's parents. Uh, it took a while to get there. I remember the first day I did it, I was a bit nervous, but now we do it every time we see each other. So that's kind of how it works. And of course, how do we say cheers in Spain? Salud, really important word. Guys, I would love to hear your tips. What did I miss? What could you recommend to people coming to Spain? Put it in the comments below. Share your knowledge uh, with other Spain lovers who are on this channel. It's really valuable for them. Thanks for watching. Hasta luego.